All right, well, this morning's text is, uh, as I already told you, Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 3. And actually, BJ, I was going to read to verse 4, but don't panic. You know, we, you can just hear it audibly. You don't have to see it on the screen. Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you, and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, we're going to be focusing on the first three verses rather than that last verse, but again, we do need to understand something of, of our um, responsibility in, in the rearing of our children. And when it says fathers, it doesn't necessarily just mean fathers, but parents, those who have authority over their children. Well, if you recall last time, we saw that the reason why the, the Father has poured His great love out upon us was that we might be conformed to the image of His Son, that we might become like Him, that we might share His image, that we might love Him as Jesus loved Him so that Jesus might be the head of a new humanity, all of whom are committed to loving God and giving Him glory. So seeing that, we began to ask the question, how did Jesus love His Father? Well, we saw very simply last week that Jesus didn't just go around saying, I love the Father. Uh, so he didn't, you know, he didn't just do it in word only, but He also did it in deed. Okay? He kept the commandments, especially the greatest commandment, Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Jesus showed his Father that he loved him with his whole life. Now, the point is, God has loved us, you know, as John tells us in 1 John 419, so that we would love him in return, so that we might do the same as Jesus did, so that as his children, we might have that same kind of filial love that Jesus had for the Father. Now, this morning, we're going to begin looking at how Jesus loved his Father, starting with obedience to his law, the law of love, the Ten Commandments. Because we need to remember that Jesus didn't keep the commandments merely to fulfill all righteousness so that he might give that to us in order to justify us. He kept them because this is what it means to love. He wanted to give us an example of how we are to live and how we are to love and honor the Father. Now, usually we would begin at the beginning with the first commandment, and we have kind of touched on that already. You shall have no other gods before me. In other words, God, the Father, should be first in our lives, even as He was in the life of Jesus Christ. But this morning, we're going to start with the fifth commandment, I think, for obvious reasons, because our attention is inevitably drawn to, you know, that, that particular commandment. At least, I, I think it is, by, if you've looked at the calendars at all. Exodus 20, verse 12. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Now, the first thing we want to see is that Jesus honored his parents. Okay, it shouldn't surprise us. But we want to also see how he did that. Now, we can't, of course, escape the fact that Jesus, as the eternal Son of God, honored his heavenly Father, didn't he? Now, he has been the Son of, of the Father from all eternity. And here we enter into somewhat of the mystery of, of the Trinity. We don't understand everything this means, except that the relationship that the Father and the Son share eternally is, is somewhat analogous, somewhat similar to what a human father and son share, or parents and, and children. Okay, the Father is called the Father, as we know from our church history, because He eternally begets the Son. And the Son is called the Son because He is eternally begotten of the Father. And again, we don't understand exactly what that means. 
somehow the being of the Father generates the Son, and the Son is eternally generated by the Father, and they have expressed the relationship that they share with each other in terms of Father and Son, which is why we understand it in this way. There's some kind of analogy. But for our purpose this morning, we want to see this, that as the eternal Son of the Father, the Son of God has loved him from all eternity with an infinite love, even to the point of being willing to come into this world as one of his creatures, as a man, that he might, of course, fulfill all righteousness, but also suffer his judgment, the judgment that was due to our sins, that he might take that upon himself and suffer his Father's wrath in order to save those whom the Father loves. So the Son of God is the obedient and loving Son. And here, of course, we have a wonderful example. But again, we have another example, don't we? Jesus, as he comes into the world, also loved and honored his earthly parents, his mother Mary, in whom he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and his stepfather Joseph, the betrothed husband of Mary. Now, we know he did this because it was necessary that he fulfilled the law, so we know he did perfectly. But of course, he also did this because Jesus is the incarnation of love. He is, a, you know, he doesn't just do it to be an example or just to fulfill the law, but he does it because this is his heart. Now, one thing that we need to bear in mind here as we look at the example of Christ and how he um, loved and honored his parents is that we don't have a lot to go on because the Gospels really focus on the life of Christ after he begins his earthly ministry, which was at about 30 years uh, of age. But there are some things in Scripture. <laughs> Actually, most of the things we read about, they may even seem questionable. They may even seem like, well, did Jesus really honor his parents here? But we, we do know that he did. Now, let me give you a few examples. Remember when his parents took him when he was 12 years old to Jerusalem for the feast? And after the feast was over, they all started off for home and they didn't realize Jesus was with them and he had stayed in the temple. And after they had gone so many days journey, they realized he wasn't there. They thought he was with the relatives. And uh, they went back to Jerusalem and they searched for him and they found him in the temple. Well, we, you know, we, we're going to come back to this in just a moment, but was, that, was Jesus honoring his parents there? Well, yes, I think he was. Or what about at the wedding of Cana of Galilee when they ran out of the wine and Mary had asked him to do something about it and he answered in this way, woman, what does this have to do with me? Okay, well, was Jesus honoring his parents? Well, yes, or his mother. Or what about when Mary and his brothers came looking for him when he was teaching in Nazareth in his hometown? And instead of going out to them, he said to those around him, who are my mother and my brothers? It almost sounds like he was sliding them. Now, these accounts may seem to call his love into question, but they, they really don't. We know that Jesus stayed behind at the temple, probably for several reasons, but among other reasons, to show his parents who, you know, who he really was. You know that uh, Mary didn't seem, even after the angel coming to her, the supernatural conception, all the things that she went through still didn't fully understand what Jesus, who he was and what he had come into the world to do. So this was um, to show his parents who he really was. They, they really, he said to them, you, you shouldn't really have been having to look for me. You should have known that I would be in my, my father's house. And he wasn't being disrespectful. He was respecting his heavenly father and honoring him, and he, he didn't disobey his parents, really, in any way there. And when, when um, Jesus called his mother Mary woman at, at this wedding in Cana of Galilee, he wasn't disrespecting her. He wasn't being rude. This was the way of, of addressing women in that culture. It was very respectful. And when he asked what the lack of wine had to do with him, he was simply telling her that he would answer her request but not because it was she who was asking. He would do this as one of his signs by which he would show himself to be the Messiah. John writes uh, later in that chapter, this beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee 
and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. So he wasn't slighting Mary. This is what he fully intended to do. And then the instance where Jesus seemed to disregard his mothers and brothers when they came to him wasn't what we might think. Um, they thought, and here again, it, it shows what was in Mary's mind and the mind of his brothers. Uh, they thought he had taken leave of his senses. That's what Mark records for us. And so they came out to get him, to take him home, right? We know the brothers weren't believing at that point, but it seems even Mary still didn't understand. But he simply used that occasion to point out that the family of God is broader than family, you know, than family lines, than blood, you might say. Everyone who does God's will is his brother and sister and mother. Jesus loved his parents. As a child, we read in Luke 2, verse 51, after they brought him back from Jerusalem and when he was 12 years of age, he continued in subjection to them. As a young man, he presumably from, really from early on until the time he began his ministry, worked alongside his, his father, Joseph. We don't know that for sure, but that's the way things worked in those days. He was likely an apprentice, uh, learning the trade of woodworking. After Joseph died, which was before his ministry began, he continued to honor and care for his mother. Um, we don't see that exactly. Of course, he had other brothers and a, and a sister as well who were also caring. But um, we do know that when he was dying on the cross, he made sure as her eldest son that she would be provided for. He said to her, remember, she stood at the, feet, uh, at the foot of the cross, Woman, behold your son. And we often think that Jesus is saying, look at me, uh, Mary. But that's not what he was saying. He was saying, look at John. Woman, behold your son, John. And he said to John, behold your mother, by which he was telling him that he should care for her now that he was, you know, dying. At that time, her children were likely unconverted, and so John would have the honor of caring for her until they should also come to faith, and they eventually did. You can imagine how difficult that would be. The brother that you grew up with, you know, perfect Jesus, he really is the Messiah, <laughs> and they believed in him and, and were saved. But the point here is Jesus loved and honored his mother. Now, for our purposes this morning, remember, God has saved us. God has redeemed us. He has loved us from all eternity. He has given us His Son, and He has given us His Holy Spirit so that we would do the same thing Jesus did, that we would honor our parents, that we would also honor Him. But that really is, you know, the first commandment. We'll get back to that later. Now, the word honor, this I think sometimes uh, can kind of throw us off a little bit. What exactly does that mean, to honor them? Well, it means to place high value on them, on, on their persons, on their words, on their well-being. It, it means to, to love them, that they have weight with us. Okay? The word honor in Hebrew, it really means weightiness. And that's, you know, it, it's something that, again, affects us. It's something we feel the, the, the burden of to give to them. Now, with regard to our parents, this is how we are to love them. That's what honoring them means, is to love them and show them this value. Now, how do we do that? Well, when, like Jesus, of course. When we were children, we love and honor our parents by obeying them, by, by doing what it is they tell us to do. Now, again, most of us here are, are older and um, we've already passed through this phase of life. Uh, we understand that, you know, we are all in this relationship at one point, and we know how difficult it was for us at that time. Our sinful hearts made it difficult, made it hard for us, because we didn't like being told what to do as, as children. But we need to understand God gave us parents and gave them authority to command us for a reason. And it's the same reason that God gives parents authority, or I should say gives any, anyone with authority that authority. You know, and why does God give authority? Is it so that we can 
lord it over those under our authority is it so we can command them what to do so it's, we never have to say please and they you know, and never have to say thank you to them. No, that's not why God gives authority. He gives authority so that we might serve those who are under our authority. As parents, we understand what that means. You know, we do have authority over our children, but our authority is meant as, um, again, uh, it, it's given to us to protect them and to serve them and to care for them and to make sure that they're going in the right direction. Now, so that was our relationship when we were children under our parents. We were to listen to their authority for our good and obey them. When we became adults, okay, we moved out of the house. Maybe we got married and we started our own households. Our relationship with our parents changed somewhat because we're no longer there every day and they no longer see us and, you know, hopefully we've grown up by this time and we're beginning to do things the right way. But the fact is, we still need to love them. We still need to honor them. We still need to listen to what they have to tell us. I think there's a remarkable example in Scripture. It's in Jeremiah 35. Perhaps you've read it before of, of the Rechabites. And as I understand, the Rechabites weren't even Jews, but they had joined themselves with the people of God. So you know, religion-wise, they were Jews, but they weren't children of Abraham. But the Lord had Jeremiah bring the Rechabites into a room and to set wine in front of them and to tell them to drink. And they said to uh, Jeremiah, we're, we're not going to drink this wine because our father Jonadab told us never to drink wine and not to live in the city but to live in tents, which means don't have a permanent dwelling but rather have a temporary dwelling. And we have listened to the voice of our father Jonadab from the time he said it until now, and by the way, Jonadab by this time it was, was dead. You know, Jonadab was the son of Rechab, and these were Jonadab's children. And the Lord commends them. He says, look, look at these Rechabites. They listened to their father, Jonadab, who told them to do these things, but my children will not listen to me. The point is that they were still honoring their father. They were still listening to him even though they were adults, even though uh, he was already gone, they were still honoring him by doing what he said. Now, we know there are limits to parents' authority. We know they're limited by, um, you know, they, they can't tell us to do something that God tells us not to do or not to do something God commands us to do. But there are other things that they can tell us, and, and we should listen to them. We should, you know, put place weight upon their words. The Lord said something similar to the priest through Malachi when he said in Malachi 1.6, a son honors his father and a servant his master. Then if I am a father, where is my honor? We need to be honoring our heavenly father, but we also need to be honoring our parents. Solomon, when he was king, would bow down to his mother Bathsheba when she entered into the room showing her honor and he would have another throne set up next to hers. He also writes in the Proverbs several things regarding how we should honor our parents. He says in Proverbs 23 verse 22, Listen to your father who begot you and do not despise your mother when she is old. So, when we're younger, under their authority, we obey them. When we're older, we still need to listen to them. When our parents are, you know, when they grow old and they're no longer able to care for themselves, we are to honor them by caring for them. And, of course, when they have finally passed from this earth, we still need to honor them. We still need to love them. We need to honor their memory, not, not speak ill of them, but, you know, remember the good things because, you know, all of our parents are, are really a mixed, you know, we're, we're all a mixed bag. Nobody's, nobody is perfect. Now, I want to, in closing, ask this question. Okay, we, we've seen that Jesus honored his parents and we've seen that we are called to do the same because Jesus is our example. And if we are to love, we need to love as he loved. But the question is why? You know, why does God want us to honor our parents? Well, we know that we're supposed to do it because the one who has authority over us, our Heavenly Father, commands us to do it. Now, this is the heart of the fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother, right? It means a lot more than this, 
but it certainly means that much. And we're also supposed to do it because Jesus did it. You know, Jesus is our example. But there's a reason why God wants us to do this. You know, he doesn't just command us to do something um, for, with, you know, what I say, for no purpose or just arbitrarily. We should honor them because of what they have done for us, all that they have done for us. This is why the Lord commands it, because in an analogous way, in a way that's similar to the way that, you know, that His love makes us His debtors, we are definitely His debtors. There's no way we can pay God back for everything He has done for us. What we owe Him is a debt of love, right? Well, the same thing is true with regard to our parents. We owe them a debt of love for all that they have done for us. And let's just think for a few moments what that debt consists of. I mean, initially, our life comes from theirs, right? Uh, it, it's true that God made us. You know, we wouldn't exist if God didn't make us. It, it's true that when conception takes place, that God creates a soul. Our soul did not come from our parents. It comes supernaturally from God. But God brought our bodies into being through them. In a very real sense, we do owe our parents our very existence. We owe them our lives. And then beyond that, we certainly owe them for their care, all the great love that they've shown us throughout our lives. I mean, for the first 20 or so years of our lives, and for some, you know, for some it's even longer, we were completely dependent on them for everything. I mean, think about what would have happened if our parents had not cared for us as infants. What if they had just left us in the room and went about their business and never came back. You know what's going to happen. We wouldn't have survived. Our, our very existence, we, we absolutely depended on them. If they hadn't cared for us, we, we would not have survived. And then think about everything that they have sacrificed for us over the years. All the soiled diapers, you know, that they had to change early on. Uh, how they made sure that, that we were fed, um, my mother used to tell me the story, she grew up during the Depression and she was a child at that time, of what her parents did for her and for her siblings when they had very little food. She says very often her parents had nothing to eat. They would, they would go without, they would sacrifice so that they could feed their children. And my mother used to say that if, if there was um, a scrap of fat, perhaps, from a piece of meat that they didn't eat, one of her parents would, would eat that piece of fat because that may be all they actually had for that day. You know, we sacrifice for our children's parents. Uh, when we were sick, they comforted us. They, they cared for us. Uh, they cleaned up after us, you know? Uh, you know. When you get sick, it's not a pretty thing. Uh, but they exposed themselves to that sickness in order to, in order to care for us. Um, I hope you don't get grossed out by this example, but I, I can't help but um, think of this example. Beverly Birchall, uh, a very close family friend, almost like a second mother uh, to, to me, used to talk about one night when uh, her son, Neil, when he was just a, a young boy, he was sick. He didn't feel well, so he came into his mother's room. Mother and dad are sleeping, wakes up, wakes up mom, wakes up Beverly, and says, Mom, I don't feel so well, and then proceeds to throw up all over, okay? Now, <laughs> the graphic image, I mean, who could, who could endure that but, but a mother, you know? And I don't think she got angry at him, you know, but she, her heart went out to him and cared for him and cleaned it all up and cleaned him up and, and cared for him. That, that's what parents do. They clothed us. They helped us with our homework. They gave us direction when we needed it. You know, for some of us, they may have been the very first to pray for us and to share the gospel with us, and, and that certainly is our obligation as parents. They may have been the first to take us to church so we could hear God's word. Some of our parents helped us with continuing education. You know, when you're a child, you, you don't you don't really appreciate these things. It takes you a while to appreciate them. When I was a child, you know, I wasn't thankful for my parents. I, I thought that was their job. That, that's why they were in the world. They, they were always adults. They were always parents. I'm talking about when I was a smaller child. They, they had always been adults. They had always been parents, and it has always been their job to take care of me, and that's why they were here, you know. It was just all me-centered, all me you know. And, 
Should I be thankful? Well, no, that's their job. And, you know, I didn't ask to be born into this family. If, if they chose to have me, that's their responsibility. And I really had no idea just how much they really sacrificed for me until I got married and had children of my own. And then I began to learn just how much work this really is and how much they really did for me. So humanly speaking, you know, we really would not be here if it wasn't for them. And we know that our, none of our parents were perfect. Some of our parents had some pretty big flaws in them. I mean, for some of us, our parents weren't even Christians, maybe for most of us here. But even though that's true, we would not be here today if it wasn't for their care for us. We all owe them a debt, no matter how, you know, again, how flawed they might be. So how can we repay them? Well, we can never really repay them for this. We can't do this, but the Lord tells us we should honor them. We should honor them for their love and their sacrifice for us. That's why the Lord has some pretty strong warnings in Scripture about dishonoring our parents. Let me just read a few of these examples because oftentimes, you know, in the Old Testament, the Lord puts it in a negative way. He does say, honor your father and your mother, but he also says this in Leviticus 20, verse 9. If there is anyone who curses his father or his mother, he shall surely be put to death. Wow, capital punishment. He has cursed his father or his mother. His blood guiltiness is upon him. You know, one of the sins that God hates most of all is the sin of ingratitude. How can you curse these, you know, these, your parents who have done so much and loved you so much and sacrificed so much for you? It just shows you the evil that's in your heart, regardless of what your parents may have done. Okay? You never curse them. Proverbs 20, verse 20, He who curses his father or his mother, his lamp will go out in time of darkness. And then Proverbs 30, verse 17, The eye that mocks a father and scorns a mother, the ravens of the valley will pick it out, and the young eagles will eat it. It's a very serious matter to dishonor uh, one's parents again because we owe them so very much. God tells us that we are to honor them, to honor them by loving them, by placing value on them, by listening to them, caring for them, and even if they're gone, honoring their memories. And by the way, we're not supposed to do this just on Mother's Day and Father's Day. That, that, you know, those are just, what is that? Somebody said that's a Hallmark Day, you know? Hallmark created this so that we would, you know, they could sell cards. Well, maybe that's the case. But it's like, it's like um, you know, Easter Sunday. We, we shouldn't think about the resurrection only on Easter Sunday. We should think about it every Lord's Day because this is the day Jesus rose from the dead. Well, we shouldn't also just honor our parents on one or, you know, just one day per year, but rather we should do this every day of each year. God says, honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. And he says that if we will do this, he will bless us. And the blessings are wonderful, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. You know, do you want things to go well with you? Do you want to have a long life? Well, this is how the Lord says we obtain it, is by honoring father and mother. So we need to be thankful that the Lord has given us parents. Again, no matter how bad they are, God has still used them to bless us, hasn't he? We need to love them. We need to be thankful. We need to honor them. And we also need to be thankful for the times when we may have violated these commandments. Maybe we did say something to our parents or about our parents that may amount to a curse you know, in our rebellious days that God didn't inflict us with, uh, with this curse. You know, that's what our sins actually deserved. But instead, God showed us mercy. And he forgave us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's given us now a heart where we can begin to appreciate the gift that he has given to us through our parents. And hopefully, uh, those of us who are raising children, hopefully our children will come to understand that while they're still young 
and not have to wait until they're in the same situation and begin to see what kind of a sacrifice being a parent really means. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer. Let's, as we do, let's thank the Lord for, again, our parents and for his mercies on us. Let's pray that God would give us the grace to honor our parents as our Lord Jesus Christ did. And uh, especially, again, as we prepare to come to the table to receive grace, to receive help in order to do this.